part seven chapter five of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook home life in south street and the country continued five six and seven during the years following her father's death eighteen seventy four miss nightingale devoted much time to the society of her mother and this took her for a considerable part of each year out of london in eighteen seventy four she and her mother spent a month at claydon august through september and then two months at lee hurst in eighteen seventy five the experiment was tried of taking a house at upper norwood and there miss nightingale lived with her mother for some weeks june through july i am out of humanity's reach wrote florence to madame mole june eighteen in a red villa like a monster lobster a place which has no raison d'etre except the raison d'etre of lobsters or crabs viz to go backward and to feed and be fed upon stranger vicissitudes than mine in life few men have had vicissitudes from slavery to power and from power to slavery again it does not seem like a vicissitude a red villa at norwood yet it is the strangest i yet have had it is the only time for twenty-two years that my work has not been the first cause for where i should live and how i should live here it is the last it is the caricature of a life the lobster-like villa was however soon given up mrs nightingale longed to be taken to her home though strictly hers no longer and from july to october she and florence were at lee hurst the year's routine now became fixed the care of mrs nightingale in london was undertaken by her nephew mr shore smith and his wife she lived with them in their house in york place and from july or august in each year to november or december the shore smith family with miss nightingale and her companion moved to lee hurst and there also florence went sometimes going to lee hurst before the others arrived and sometimes staying there when they were absent mr shore smith was more than son and daughter to her mrs nightingale said and florence during her residence at lee hurst devoted a stated number of hours each day generally two or three in the morning to companionship with her mother in the country as in south street miss nightingale constantly had nursing friends to stay with her at lee hurst writes the friend already quoted she was as good to us as in london i remember being there once with another of her pupils and she told us that the rooms assigned to us had been the nurseries of her childhood long drives were contrived for us luncheon was packed in the wagonette and excursions were mapped out during our visit mr jowett came for a few days he was very pleasant to us and full of kindness i remember his speaking of a quality in our hostess which always struck us i mean the thoroughness in all details of her hospitality even to putting flowers in our rooms gathered by herself in the garden miss nightingale thought one of us was tired and said she was not to get up too early in the morning mr jowett reminded us in this connection of the man who made a virtue of always rising very early and who was conceited all the morning and cross all the afternoon at lee hurst during these years miss nightingale devoted herself to her poorer neighbours and threw into the task the thoroughness and system which characterised all her doings she took a part in establishing a village coffee-room and a village library and in organising mothers meetings she gave doles to all deserving families the dossier which she kept of their characters and circumstances were as careful as those referring to the nightingale probationers there are sheets and sheets amongst her papers on which she entered the quantities of each kind of provision supplied to each family as elaborate as the purveying accounts which she kept at scutari she was a sort of national health insurance scheme non-contributory for the neighbourhood for she employed a doctor to attend the sick and infirm at her expense and to report fully to her on all the cases 
there are fifty letters from him in this sort during a single year and as many of a like kind from the village schoolmaster whom she commissioned to give extra tuition to promising pupils there were those who thought that miss nightingale wasted on these rustic cares energies that might swell the great wave of the world among the number was her old friend madame mole now my own flow she wrote october sixteenth eighteen seventy nine you believe me i am sure to love you truly therefore you will bear what i say and also you believe me to have common sense you can't help believing it i defy you now i declare that if you don't leave that absurd place leehurst immediately you must be a little insane partially not entirely and that if you saw another person knowingly risking a life that might be useful dans les grandes choses ensemble to potter after sick individuals and if you were in a lucid moment you would say that person is not quite sane or she has not the strength of will to follow her judgment in her actions miss nightingale was not well pleased by this letter she felt something of the sort herself but it is one thing to doubt our own wisdom and quite another to hear it doubted even by our oldest friends miss nightingale replied that she was doing her duty which was a duty of affection to her mother and madame mole with ready tact explained her letter away by saying that the real reason of it was only a selfish impatience to see her dear flochen in london miss nightingale's mother was now very old her mind was barely coherent and it would perhaps have been much the same to her if florence had not been by her side yet the actual presence was a great comfort and miss nightingale whose calls in earlier life had estranged her somewhat from her mother was the more anxious to be with her now there were gleams of brightness in the mother's manner which touched the daughter deeply her mind she afterwards wrote was like the ceiling of the sistine chapel darkened blotted effaced and with great gaps but if you looked and looked and accustomed your eye to the dimness and the broken lights there were the noble forms transparent through the darkness mother and daughter had much converse on spiritual things at other times pride and pleasure in her famous daughter were mixed in the mother's mind with the regrets of earlier years where is florence she once asked in the daughter's absence is she still in her hospital i suppose she will never marry now she loved to have longfellow's poem read to her it is all true she would say all real when florence came the mother loved her presence dearly who are you oh yes i see you are florence stay with me do not leave me it makes me so happy to see you sitting by me you come down to teach us to love but you have so much that is important to do you must not stay with me oh are you my dearest florence i ought to kiss your hand i am sure the daughter's wit cheered her mother you have a right to laugh she said so few of us have you are so good so much better than the rest of us you do me so much good something of the same impression was made by miss nightingale upon all who visited her whether at lee hurst or in her upper room at south street she was often lonely and despondent and accounted herself as we have heard the weakest of human vessels the lowest of god's servants to those who knew her well she was a tower of strength mr jowett used to say that he never saw miss nightingale or received a letter from her without feeling strengthened for his duties the thought of her working in solitude was constantly with him i think no day passes he wrote to her in which i do not think of you and your work with pride and affection if men admired miss nightingale women worshipped her to many a devoted woman who had learnt from her example and who was inspired by her friendship she was my mistress and queen or my hero saint women of the great world laid at her feet in almost equal adoration and young girls had something of the same feeling i used at first to be shy with her says one of them but when i was older and talked more freely i found her the most charming person to talk to she always seemed interested and glad to see one i always used to come away with a sort of buoyant feeling she seemed to raise one into a different atmosphere i shall ever remember my visit to you wrote her ever affectionate louise 
the grand duchess of baden in eighteen seventy nine as one of those moments coming directly out of god's hand and leading men's hearts up to him in thankfulness it belongs to those things which are in themselves a sanctuary and lady ashburton who still came sometimes to see the friend of earlier days her beloved zoe wrote i like to think of you in your tower so high up above us all and again i am humbled in the dust when i think of what you say of me poor wretched profitable less me and yourself the guiding star to so many of our lives six the friends to whom miss nightingale wrote most regularly on matters other than business and in whose visits she took the greatest intellectual pleasure were next to mr jowett monsieur and madame mole her letters to them show some of her more general interests to monsieur mole february sixteenth eighteen sixty eight i see mademoiselle blanche is publishing her impression de femme what is that do men publish their impression d'homme i think it is a pity that women should always look upon themselves and men look upon them as a great curiosity a peculiar strange race like the aztecs or rather like dr howe's idiots whom after the unremitting exertions of two years he actually taught to eat with a spoon to m mole south street november twenty fourth eighteen seventy two insensible cruel aggravating man you break off just where i want to hear the only thing that amuses me is papal infallibility the only thing that interests me not painfully out of my chaos always excepting livingstone east african slave trade central african exploration is prussian politics not that i suppose you to be very well satisfied with them but i want to know about the doings bismarck old catholics infallibilists this extraordinary conflict between the old man at rome and the junker devil statesman bismarck also about the struggle with the upper house and the de feudalizing bill i am athirst to know your mind about these things have you seen stanley's how i found livingston i have desired the publisher to send you a copy it is without exception the very worst book on the very best subject i ever saw in all my life still i can't help devouring the book to the end though it tells little more of livingstone than what livingstone in the dispatches has told himself already but then stanley and his newspaper have discovered and relieved livingstone when all our government all our societies all our subscriptions all the queen's men could not set livingstone up again quetelet has sent me his last books anthropometrie and physique sociale with a charming letter i answered by a violent and vehement exhortation to him to prepare his second edition at once the first eighteen sixty nine of the physique sociale being entirely exhausted did i tell you that when mr jowett was elected chairman for the subjects of final examination at oxford i insisted on social physics being one to madame mohl south street december nineteen eighteen seventy three you asked me what mill's autobiography was like and as it is a book impossible to describe i send it to you i think it almost the most curious and interesting of modern books i ever read but curious just as much for its nonsense as for its sense i should think the account he gives of his intellectual and moral growth from the age of three quite unique quite as singular as if a man were able to describe all his anatomy and physiology in a state of growth from the time he was three but quite quite as extraordinary as this is his own stupidity in not seeing that very many of his moral and intellectual and especially of his religious opinions were fixed inalterably for him by the process he underwent so that all his reasoning afterwards upon them was unreasoning fixed as much beyond his power to change or even to see that a change was desirable or possible as the eyes of a man who becomes stone blind in his youth or the right arm of a man who is paralyzed on that side or etc 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 he has written me pages and pages which i never could understand from a man so able till i read his autobiography that there being laws was no proof of there being a lawgiver that if evil were to produce good there ought to be more of it 
then you see he says in his book that his wife was to be applauded because she had thrown aside the monstrous superstition that this world could be made on the best possible design for perfecting good through evil and i still think the autobiography its high tone its disinterested nobility of feeling and love of mankind one of the most inspiring modern books i know but then please to remember when mill left the india office he might most materially have helped all my sanitary commissions irrigation and civilizing schemes for india he did nothing he was quite incapable of understanding anything but schemes on paper correspondence the literary office aspect in short for india as for that jargon about the inspiration coming from woman i really am incapable of conceiving its meaning if it has any at all i am sure that my part in administration has been the very reverse of inspiration it has been the fruit of dogged work of hard experience and observation such as few men have undergone correcting by close detail work the errors of men which came from what i suppose is called their inspiration what i should call their theory without practical knowledge or patient personal experience to madame molesell street february twenty seventh eighteen seventy five do read pascal's provincial there is nothing like it in the world it is as witty as moliere it is as closely reasoned as aristotle it has a style transparent like plato you said you had not read it i have a great mind to send it you i read it every year as lord morpeth said he did miss austen's novels for the pure pleasure it gives my imagination voltaire said did he not that though pascal was foo he fixed the language nothing that she read in these years pleased her more than mr john morley's fine address on popular culture now included in his miscellanies which first appeared in the fortnightly review for november eighteen seventy six she wrote to him to express her grateful admiration and to ask if she might be allowed to distribute copies of the paper mr morley who had already arranged for a cheap reprint sent her several copies in january eighteen seventy six came the death of m mole to madame mole an irreparable loss she was never the same woman after it to miss nightingale also a heavy loss i am grieved to see wrote mr jowett to her january seventh that you have lost a friend one of the best and truest you ever had his death must bring back many old recollections your father told me of his fetching you away from the convent when you were ill and as he thought saving your life but it was not only that his death revived affectionate recollections mr mole had a great admiration for miss nightingale's intellectual powers he loved to talk and correspond with her on politics literature and philosophy and she regarded his studies in eastern religion as a real contribution to theodike one of her principal preoccupations miss nightingale lost another friend a few weeks later whose death greatly moved her dr e a parks to miss nightingale southampton march nine dictated your letter reached me on what must be i believe my deathbed perhaps before you receive this i shall be summoned to my account for what you say i thank and bless you about two months hence the society for promoting christian knowledge will publish a little book on the personal care of health a copy will be sent to you i had small space only twenty-six pages but i put in as much sanitary information as i could of a very simple kind i hope it may be a little useful to you it is addressed entirely to the poor and now thank you and bless you for all the support you have always given me believe me very gratefully signed e a parks miss nightingale to dr h w ackland thirty five south street march seventeen eighteen seventy six the death of our dear friend dr parks fills me with grief and also with anxiety for the future of the army medical school at netley he was a man of most rare modesty of singular gifts his influence at the school there was not a man who did not leave the better for having been under him is irreplaceable but the knowledge and instruction he has diffused from the school as a centre has extended and will extend wherever the english language is spoken and beyond dr parks died like a true christian hero at his post and with the simplicity of one 
i think i have never known such disinterestedness such self-abnegation such forgetfulness of self his death was like a resurrection when he was dying he dictated letters or gave messages to everybody all about what ought to be done for the school for the spread of hygienic knowledge for other useful and army purposes none about himself on march nine when it was evident he could not last many days he commended the school to sir william jenner and dictated a letter to me about hygienic interests merely saying of himself that he might be summoned to his last account before i received it on march thirteen he rallied i was allowed to send down a trained nurse on march fifteen he died let us as he went to the sacrifice of himself he was only fifty-six with joy and praise as the heroes of old so part with him but let us try to save what he would have saved the professors at the army medical school had written to miss nightingale in alarm at a report in the newspapers that the institution was once more threatened she begged dr ackland who was a friend of the war secretary mr gaythorne hardy to do what he could and meanwhile she took direct action herself she drew up for mr hardy as she had done years before for mr cardwell the case for the defence of the school she added personal entreaties of her own and she sent sir harry verney to present the documents to the minister in person mr hardy listened attentively while i read your papers reported sir harry i emphasized passages underlined by you indeed showing him your marks and initials he said that he had not decided the matter and i replied and miss nightingale wants to get hold of you before you do i shall congratulate you most earnestly my dearest florence if your representation save the school for i know that such success cheers you more than anything else three weeks later the minister returned the papers to sir harry announced that the school would not be touched and said he might tell miss nightingale that he would make the appointments she had suggested some unfinished letters from m mohl found in his blotter after his death were sent to miss nightingale by madame mohl who leaned much on her flochin's sympathy in her loss to madame mohl lee hurst august sixth eighteen seventy six dearest very dearest friend indeed i do think i was worthy of him if always thinking of him rejoicing in his progress and perfection and formerly grieving with his troubles and cares but now he has none now he is always making glorious progress else this world is a nonsense made me so but why do you distress yourself your loss is great enough immeasurable irreparable for this world with saying such things about not having made the most of him while you had him he would not have said so you found him a melancholy man you made him a happy one you gave zest to his life all that it wanted he always felt this himself he could not bear to be without you oh thank god and say like the lord of ossory about his son i had rather have my dead son than any one else's living one who has been so blessed as you where will you find so perfect a man and you felt it i know you did and he felt your feeling it for m mohl's glorious life on earth i thank god but i thank him yet more because this was only a beginning of life infinitely more glorious as milton says death called life which us from life doth sever fare you well may god be with us all your old flow it is twenty years to-day since i came back from the crimea it is fifteen since i lost sidney herbert to the same south street february seventh eighteen seventy eight dearest friend ever dearest indeed i do i think daily and nightly of him and of you the world is darker every year to me and darker without him for it seems as if a great light were gone out of it and the people who survive seem so weary stale flat and unprofitable compared with those i knew once loved once no we shan't give a doit to help the turks what crush all those struggling young peoples sclav and greek back under the hideous massacres and oppression and corruption of the turk we could not if we would i don't feel very hopeful for the worst eurasian government we are allowing the worst european government to substitute itself turkey was falling to pieces anyhow by its own bad weight and we should not have let russia act alone in the coming freedom may god give liberty to the christian provinces to work out their own salvation miss nightingale's interest in the eastern question moved by the turkish atrocities in bulgaria had been heightened by her close friendship with miss paulina irby of the women friends whom miss nightingale saw frequently with whom she corresponded regularly miss irby was one of the few who could in any intellectual and spiritual sense be called her equal 
miss irby was a woman of the highest civilization an excellent scholar a woman of most generous kindliness and simplicity of mind who truly thought no evil there was a sort of innocence in her that seemed to disperse difficulties of itself and miss nightingale's papers contain references to occasions on which miss irby's friendly offices resolved many worries she was a friend of mr and mrs nightingale and florence had first met her at embley in eighteen sixty nine she was one of the many women who revered the name of florence nightingale and she had spent some months at kaiserswerth she was enraptured by making the personal acquaintance of her heroine and was used to say henceforth that any good she was able to do was owing to miss nightingale's example and sympathy the good that miss irby did was great in promoting education among the sclavonic christians of bosnia and herzegovina and in relieving the distress among orphans and refugees during the years eighteen seventy four to seventy nine miss irby was often in england to collect funds and for other purposes connected with her work in the east miss nightingale helped her much therein and thus became very familiar with some aspects of the eastern question this interest combined with her detestation of the forward policy on the indian frontier formed a link of sympathy with mr gladstone seven was miss nightingale's life happy or unhappy her sister used to say to her thinking of her many political acquaintances you lead such an interesting life mr jowett told her that her life was a blessed one and that she ought so to think it he always sent her a new year's letter and on the last day of eighteen seventy nine he wrote to her thus benjamin jowett to miss nightingale i cannot let the new year begin without sending my best and kindest wishes for you and for your work i can only desire that you should go on as you are doing in your own way lessening human suffering and speaking for those who cannot make their voices heard with less of suffering to yourself if this as i fear be not a necessary condition of the life you have chosen there was a great deal of romantic feeling about you twenty-three years ago when you came home from the crimea i really believe that you might have been a duchess if you had played your cards better and now you work on in silence and nobody knows how many lives are saved by your nurses in hospitals you have introduced a new era in nursing how many thousand soldiers who would have fallen victims to bad air bad water bad drainage and ventilation are now alive owing to your forethought and diligence how many natives of india they might be counted probably by hundreds of thousands in this generation and in generations to come have been preserved from famine and depression and the load of debt by the energy of a sick lady who can scarcely rise from her bed the world does not know all this or think about it but i know it and often think about it and i want you to so that in the later years of your course you may see with a side of sorrow what a blessed life yours is and has been is there anything which you could do or would wish to do other than you are doing though you are overtaxed and have a feeling of oppression at the load which rests upon you i think that the romance too which is with the past did a great deal of good like dr pusey you are a myth in your own lifetime do you know that there are thousands of girls about the ages of eighteen to twenty-three named after you as you once said to me the world has not been unkind everybody has heard of you and has a sweet association with your name it is about seventeen years since we first became friends how can i thank you properly for all your kindness and sympathy never failing when you had so many other things to occupy your mind i have not been able to do so much as you expected of me and probably never shall be though i do not give up ambition but i have been too much distracted by many things and not strong enough for the place i shall go on as quietly and industriously as i can if i ever do much more it will be chiefly owing to you your friendship has strengthened and helped me and never been a source of the least pain or regret farewell may the later years of your life be clearer and happier and more useful than the earlier if you will believe it this may be so in mr jowett's example his friend found strength and help even as he did in hers he offers himself up to oxford she used to say of him with admiration and she offered up all her powers to the causes she had espoused there were still to be many years during which she was able to work unceasingly for them her life was to be not less useful than before and perhaps as increasing years brought greater calm her life was also clearer but happiness as the world accounts it she neither attained nor desired she had a friend 
who was losing his devotion to high ideals as she thought in domestic contentment oh happiness she said of him like the bread tree fruit what a corrupter and paralyzer of human nature thou art end of home in south street and the country continued five six seven part seven chapter six of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook lord ripon and general gordon eighteen eighty to eighteen eighty five parts one two three four and five i thank god for all he is doing in india through lord ripon florence nightingale eighteen eighty four general gordon was the bravest of men where god's cause and that of others was concerned and his courage rose with loneliness he was the meekest of men where himself only was concerned you could not say he was the most unselfish of men he had no self florence nightingale eighteen eighty six south street february two eighteen eighty dearest my dear mother fell asleep just after midnight after much weariness and painfulness the last three hours were in beautiful peace and all through she had been able to listen to and to repeat her favourite hymns and prayers and to smile a smile as if she said i'm dying it's all right then she composed her own self to death at nine last night folded her hands closed her own eyes laid herself down and in three hours she was gone to a greater love than ours do you remember what ezekiel says and at eve my wife died and i did in the morning as i was commanded miss nightingale's mother had almost completed her ninety-third year queen victoria sent a message of sympathy to which miss nightingale replied with particulars of the last hours such as her majesty was known to like and she asked leave to address a letter to the empress of india on the condition of that country permission was granted and doing in the morning as she was commanded miss nightingale turned from thoughts of her mother's death to the grievances of the indian peoples and composed in general terms a plea for their redress the queen made no response but presently she sent a copy of the life of the prince consort the life contains much information about the famous proclamation to the people of india in which the queen and the prince consort had been personally concerned and miss nightingale made use of the fact when she next had an opportunity of addressing her sovereign on indian subjects meanwhile miss nightingale was suffering from nervous collapse and the doctors ordered sea air she went for three weeks to the granville hotel ramsgate but the change did her little good the doctors tell me she wrote to miss pringle march twenty eighth i must be free for at least a year from the responsibilities which have been forced upon me and which they might say i have so ill fulfilled and from letters but when is that year to come i believe however i must go away again for a time if only to work up the arrears of my indian work which weigh heavily on my mind she went in april for a few weeks to seaton where lady ashburton had placed seaforth lodge at her disposal she was not to be disturbed but her hostess came from melchett for a few days and had as she wrote the deep joy of communion with my beloved in the following month miss nightingale spent some days at claydon where in subsequent years she often stayed for a longer time taking much interest in local affairs there her sister was now and henceforth an invalid suffering sadly from rheumatic arthritis nothing cheered her so much said sir harry verney as her sister's society and now that mrs nightingale's death made visits to lee hurst less imperative they hoped that florence would treat claydon more as a home than heretofore 
she did as she was bidden and for several years paid an annual visit to claydon where florence nightingale's room is still shown for the rest miss nightingale's life continued on the old lines and whether at claydon or in south street the sabbatical year of freedom from responsibilities letters interviews and blue books did not come two in the spring of eighteen eighty miss nightingale was intensely interested in the elections her dislike of lord beaconsfield's policy her recent intercourse with mr gladstone her hopes for india her interest in the verneys as well as her own sympathy with liberal ideas and the liberalism traditional in her family made her a stout partisan i hope dearest she wrote to a nursing friend march twenty eighth you care about the elections you are in the thick of them sir harry with patriotic pluck is in his seventy-ninth year fighting a losing battle at buckingham but what delights me is that the liberal side find that the labourers and the working man have waked up during the last six years to interests entirely new to them then six years ago we could hardly get a hearing now men jam themselves into small hot rooms struggling for standing-room while for three hours they listen to political talk whether we win or not such interest will never die when the liberal victory was complete she was eager like the rest of the political world to know who would be prime minister and more anxious than other people except the few personally concerned to know who would succeed lord lytton as viceroy of india sir harry verney sent her the latest rumours from the, the row in the morning and from the clubs in the afternoon she must have been greatly pleased when lord ripon's appointment to india was announced but curiously there is no note about it nor any record of a visit from him nor at this stage any correspondence they were however old friends and as soon as lord ripon set to work in india correspondence at once cordial and confidential began advocacy of lord ripon's indian policy was indeed one of the absorbing interests which occupied miss nightingale during the years covered in the present chapter her other main preoccupation was the state of the army medical and hospital service a matter which became urgent in connection with the campaigns in south africa egypt and the soudan these two branches of work now occupied the front but they did not cause miss nightingale to abandon other responsibilities and the reader must supply a background of the various kinds of work described in earlier chapters she was still busy with details of indian sanitation for the sanitary annual was still submitted to her revision she was still consulted on questions of nursing administration and hospital construction they are in difficulties wrote sir harry verney january thirty eighteen eighty one in forwarding an application of this kind so they appeal to you the family solicitor to whom we all turn when we get into a scrape but your family is a large one the whole human race she still filled the part of lady bountiful with more than that lady's usual care for detail to her poorer neighbours in the country the working men's institute at holloway near leehurst referred to her the question whether playing cards should be admitted she was in favour of the cards but a majority of the committee were against them and before giving her opinion she conducted an inquiry as elaborate and far-searching as if it were a case of cholera and more assiduously rather than less did she devote herself to the affairs of the nightingale school and its old pupils there are years at this period during which as many as four hundred letters from nurses were preserved in this sort and there are sisters to each of whom more than fifty letters were written she introduced the innovation of sending her probationers to the national training school of cookery and she looked over their notes on the lessons founding thereon hints to the teachers the extension of trained nursing in workhouse infirmaries called for more nightingale nurses yesterday she wrote to madame mole june thirty eighteen eighty one we opened the new marylebone infirmary seven hundred and sixty beds we nurse it with our trained nurses thank god i have each of these women to see for three or four hours alone before she begins work 
it was during this period that miss nightingale paid her first visit to the new st thomas's hospital she drove there on january twenty seventh eighteen eighty two and inspected the quarters of her training school and one of the hospital wards just one week has elapsed wrote the matron february four since you honoured us with your more than welcome presence and i cannot go to bed to-night until i have thanked you for all the admiration in which you speak of your home and the pretty alexandra ward no words of mine can ever express the delight it gave us to welcome you our dearly loved chief to the home and school which has for more than twenty years borne her honoured name the time was drawing near when pupils of the school were to follow in the footsteps of their chief and do nursing service in the east three in april eighteen eighty a notable addition was made to miss nightingale's hero friends general gordon introduced himself to her in order to introduce his cousin mrs hawthorne she was the wife of a colonel in the engineers and devoted herself to good work in military hospitals she had been painfully impressed by the inefficiency of the orderlies and had begged general gordon to go to miss nightingale in the matter the character of chinese gordon was already most sympathetic to miss nightingale and the personal touch now heightened her admiration she gained at the same time in his cousin a friend to whom she became warmly attached and who served as eyes and ears for her in a way which enabled her to forward useful reforms general gordon's letters appealed strongly to miss nightingale as those of a kindred soul general gordon to miss nightingale april twenty two eighteen eighty in these days when so much is talked of the prestige of england etc etc i cannot help feeling a bitter sentiment when one considers how little we care for those near and how we profess to care for those afar off you wrote some kind words on your card when i called and i am much obliged for them but i do not think that i have done one twentieth part or suffered anything like the nurse of a hospital who forgotten by the world drudges on in obscurity april twenty nine i do not know the details myself i took up the paper on the entreaties of my cousin feeling sure that the truest way to gain recruits to our army would be by so remedying the defects and alleviating the sufferings of soldiers that universally should it be acknowledged that the soldier is cared for in every way decorations may popularize the army to the few but proper and considerate attention to the many is needed to do so to the public to my mind it is astonishing how great people who have all the power to remedy these little defects who pride themselves on the prestige of our name whose time must hang so very heavily on their hands can remain year after year heedless of the sick and afflicted i speak from experience when i say that both in china and sudan i gained the hearts of my soldiers who would do anything for me not by my justice etc but by looking after them when sick and wounded and by continually visiting the hospitals if you cannot help us well i fall back on my verse if thou seest the oppression of the poor and violent perversity of judgment marvel not at it for he that is higher than the highest regardeth it miss nightingale took the matter up at once she put the case into form and submitted it through sir harry verney to the secretary for war mr childers who promised to look into it presently he called for a report on hospital nursing by orderlies and in august the departmental answer was forwarded to miss nightingale i have seen such answers she wrote at the crimean war time the patient has died of neglect and want of proper attendance but by regulation should not have died therefore the allegation that he is dead is disposed of in this case the allegations were not disposed of as we shall hear presently early in may general gordon left england as private secretary to lord ripon and before starting he sent one of his little books of comfort to miss nightingale he resigned the incongruous appointment almost as soon as he had reached india and after a special mission in china returned to england 
he saw miss nightingale and announced his intention of going to syria miss nightingale upbraided him his past claimed more of his future than a tour of curiosity in the east why should he not return to india in an unofficial character she could tell him of much work to do there general gordon to miss nightingale southampton april fourth eighteen eighty one you have written most kindly and far too highly of me for i find no responding tone in my heart to make me claim such praise i will explain exactly how i am situated i consider my life done that i can never aspire to or seek employment when one's voice must be still to some particular note therefore i say it is done and the only thing now left to me is to drift along to its natural end and in the endeavour to do what little good one may be able to do syria is to me no land of attraction all lands are indifferent i go for no desire of curiosity but simply because it is a quiet land and a land where small means can do much good that is all my reason for going there i would have gone to the cape i would have gone to india as you suggest but i would never do so if i had to accept the shibboleth of the indian or colonial official classes my life is truly to me a straw but i must live would that it could go to give you and all others the sense that they are all risen in christ even now even if it was at the cost of my eternal existence such is the love i have for my fellow-creatures but the door is shut i cannot live in england for though i have many many millions in my home i am only put on short allowance here though it is ample for me with my wants i cannot visit the sick in london it is too expensive i can do so in syria and where the sick are there is our lord i would do anything i could for india but i feel sure my advent there would not be allowed the time was presently to come when gordon's wish was in a way he knew not to be granted and his death was to be an inspiration unto many for the present miss nightingale hoped for the cape or some other colonial duty rather than syria and sir harry verney wrote to mr gladstone on the matter mentioning her name this she had not intended never reluctant to intervene in cases which might be considered within her competence she had the strongest objection to weakening her influence by any appearance of meddling in matters wherein she had no better right to express an opinion than anybody else she scolded sir harry severely for his indiscretion but mr gladstone sent a friendly answer april twenty sixth he will make the circumstances known to lord kimberley who he is sure will like himself desire to turn colonel gordon's services to account gordon meanwhile whose rapid changes of intention must at this time have been puzzling to his friends had accepted a military appointment at mauritius which however was soon followed by one at the cape before leaving england he again sent miss nightingale some of his little books she never saw or heard directly from him again but from brussels on the day before his fateful interview with the british cabinet in london he wrote to sir harry verney january seventeenth eighteen eighty four i daily come and see you in spirit you and miss nightingale and from khartoum february twenty sixth i am among the ruins of a government and it is not cheerful work however many pray for me and if it is god's will i shall hope to get all things quieted down ere long there is not much human hope in my wish but i force myself to trust him indeed one ought to be content with his help and in fact can lean on no other for i have none unless he will turn the hearts of men towards peace i have no hope i wish i could have called and seen you and miss nightingale but i had no time after his death she took for some years a lively interest in the management of the gordon boys home it was at a meeting in connection with it that her words quoted at the head of this chapter were read four during the years eighteen eighty one and eighteen eighty two miss nightingale was very busy with indian questions and when lord ripon's policy was disclosed he became a hero to her almost comparable to general gordon 
in forwarding to lord ripon a copy of one of her indian pieces she sent her deepest reverence and highest hopes for all the great measures by which the viceroy is bringing peace to the people of india and fulfilling england's pledges and the love and blessing of india's people be upon him readers of the present generation who do not remember the political controversies of thirty years ago and who are familiar with experiments in indian reform more daring in some respects than any which lord ripon attempted may wonder at miss nightingale's enthusiasm but it was very natural to one holding her views at the time the admiration which she felt for lord ripon and his policy was equalled by the passionate detestation felt by the larger if not the better part of anglo-indian opinion the opposition to the ilbert bill named after the member of the legislative council who introduced it was intensely bitter that to some other branches of lord ripon's policy hardly less so miss nightingale was behind the scenes both at calcutta or simla and in london in india by confidential communications from lord ripon himself in london through friends in the india office she knew how uncertain was the support he received in his own council and how strong was the opposition in the council in downing street he was a good man fighting against adversity and she was eager to do what she could to help him his reforms were also hers she had spent years of labour in mastering the intricacies of land tenure in india for years her heart had been full of the grievances of the cultivators and now lord ripon had prepared land reform bills for bengal and oude which if passed would give the riot security against oppression she had thought much and written something on indian education it was not enough she had said to read locke and mill she wanted an education which would teach the peoples of india to be men which would encourage them to the better cultivation of agriculture and industries which would enable every patel village headman to understand and enforce the principles of sanitation and lord ripon had appointed an education commission eighteen eighty two from which some useful reforms followed as for the ilbert bill which sought to confer upon duly qualified native judges powers equal to their position it was in miss nightingale's eyes a measure of simple justice and duty it was an honest fulfilment within its scope of the proclamation of eighteen fifty eight in which the queen declared her pleasure that as far as may be our subjects of whatever race or creed be impartially admitted to our service the duties of which they may be qualified by their education ability and integrity duly to discharge lord ripon's measures in the direction of local self-government similarly appealed to miss nightingale it has been thought by some that lord ripon attempted too much and allowed too little for lord salisbury's periods of indian cosmogony but in these matters some one must begin and if some of the hopes raised by lord ripon's pronouncements have been doomed to disappointment the fears of his more frantic opponents have been in at least equal measure belied by the event miss nightingale was among those with whom hope ran highest her fundamental doctrine of human perfectibility by divine order encouraged her to see in lord ripon the providential instrument of vast changes she approved wholeheartedly of all that he actually proposed writing him letters of enthusiastic encouragement and she also plied him with suggestions of further reforms in particular she sent him a scheme in which captain galton dr sutherland and sir richard temple collaborated with her for village sanitation in india she regarded his viceroyalty almost as the beginning of the millennium miss nightingale however was no idle or vague enthusiast she was one of those who while they fix their eyes on the stars keep their feet firmly planted on the ground she was as indefatigable as ever in mastering every detail a process in which lord ripon's supply of minutes and other documents provided abundant material and she continued to see and correspond with every available anglo-indian or indian who could help her or whom she could hope to influence there were two main lines on which her activities moved india says she wrote we want all the help you can give us from home 
so then she devoted herself in the first place to the support of lord ripon's policy she was constant in inspiring sympathizers at home to fresh exertions she suggested meetings and propaganda she wrote articles and assisted others to write she was in constant communication with sir william wedderburn she made the acquaintance of mr a o hume the father of the indian national congress she saw mr dadabai naoroji mr la mohan gos and other indian gentlemen but miss nightingale had no fanatical belief in the value of legislative reforms in themselves they are worth no more than the public opinion and the individual effort which they express or inspire if lord ripon's policy was indeed to inaugurate a millennium in india there must be a new zeal alike in anglo-indian administration and among the more educated classes of india in her interviews with the latter she was constant in impressing upon them how much each one might do in promoting sanitation and education she took a lively interest in the zanana mission she saw mrs scarlieb when that lady went out to practise medicine in india corresponded with her and gave her introductions lord roberts came to see her june eighteen eighty one before taking up his appointment as commander-in-chief in madras mr ilbert had seen her before going out as judicial member of the governor-general's council and they kept up a correspondence sir mount stuart grant duff similarly called on his appointment to the governorship of madras june eighteen eighty one and throughout his term of office he wrote reporting progress on all matters likely to interest her miss nightingale was particularly interested in agricultural development and education she saw much of sir james caird and corresponded with mr w r robertson the principal of the agricultural college in madras candidates selected for the indian civil service were now given the option of a year's study at the university before going out and at balliol mr arnold toynbee was appointed a lecturer to them miss nightingale made his acquaintance and corresponded with him i know nothing she wrote may thirty eighteen eighty two that tells so soon so widely so vigorously as indian civil service administration balliol sends forth her raw missionaries and in four years from the time he was an undergraduate see what a man may do could not some instruction be given she suggested october twenty eighteen eighty two in agriculture and forestry so as at least to direct your students attention to what are the peculiar wants of india a knowledge often absent in her rulers in agricultural chemistry in botany as regards plants and woods in geology as regards soils and water supply in forestry as regards rainfall and fuel in animal physiology as regards breeds fodder and cattle diseases there is much ignorance in india what if scientific agriculture could be taught at oxford these things have of late years been done both at oxford and at cambridge then miss nightingale discussed with mr toynbee the importance of familiarizing the students with the agrarian conditions in india so as to open the minds of these future administrators and judges to the real significance of their position and its responsibilities to this end she induced her friend sir george campbell to give a course of lectures at oxford of her own writings during this period the most considerable was an elaborate exposition and defence of lord ripon's bengal land tenure bill of which as of his other measures the fate was hanging in the balance this paper entitled in her fanciful way the dumb shall speak and the deaf shall hear or the riot the zaminder and the government was read by mr frederick verney at a meeting of the east india association at exeter hall on june one eighteen eighty three with sir bartle frere in the chair it was well reported there was a full attendance of distinguished anglo-indians and a lively discussion followed miss nightingale printed her paper as a pamphlet and distributed it widely the discussion showed much difference of opinion but every speaker paid a tribute to miss nightingale's knowledge and devotion 
there was one who was able from personal experience to recall the thoughts of the audience to other scenes wherein she had won her first renown this was surgeon major vincent ambler i was sick in hospital at balaclava he said and she nursed me through a long illness of crimean fever she was with me i might almost say night and day and it is to her good nursing and energetic attention i owe my recovery previous to my illness i had had experience of her friendship when at scutari where the hospitals were crammed with dead and dying and cholera was carrying off hundreds of victims a day it was amid such scenes as this that i constantly beheld miss nightingale scenes not quite so terrible but yet not entirely different had been witnessed at this time in other fields of war and miss nightingale though no longer able to be in the midst of them herself played some part nevertheless in ministering to the sick through her pupils and in seeking to remedy defects in administration which the test of war had once more revealed to these scenes leaving lord ripon's measures trembling in the balance we must now turn five the egyptian campaign of eighteen eighty two called for female nurses and miss nightingale worked at high pressure in selecting them and arranging details of their outfit i have been working some days she told mrs hawthorne august three eighteen eighty two from four thirty a m till ten p m mrs deeble of netley was in command of the female nursing corps twenty four strong in which several old pupils of the nightingale school at st thomas's were enrolled they wrote repeatedly to their chief at home and she sent them constant messages of advice and encouragement a thousand thanks for your dear kind letter which seems to have given me fresh vigour to combat against our many difficulties how good and kind you are to send me that welcome telegram a few words now and then from you are so cheering there are hundreds of such notes the spirit of an old campaigner revived in miss nightingale as she read of stirring deeds whether earlier in south africa or now in egypt nor had her children in the army altogether forgotten their old friend there were four men wounded at majuba who were detained for some weeks in hospital at netley they spent their time of convalescence in making a patchwork quilt and asked that it should be sent from them to florence nightingale in november eighteen eighty two the guards began to return from egypt a regiment of them grenadiers was under the command of colonel philip smith a nephew of sir harry verney who persuaded miss nightingale to drive to the station to see their arrival she was deeply moved november thirteenth eighteen eighty two for the first time for twenty-five years i went out to see a sight to victoria station to see the return of the foot guards anybody might have been proud of these men's appearance like shabby skeletons or at least half their former size in worn but well clean campaigning uniform not spruce or showy but alert silent steady and not a man of them all i am sure but thought he had nothing in what he had done to be proud of though we might well be proud of them royalty was there with its usual noble simplicity to bid them an unobtrusive welcome the men not the royalty were to be all in all on that occasion a more deeply felt and less showy scene could not have been imagined so miss nightingale noted at the time and presently she included her description in one of the letters which she sent every now and then at the commanding officer's request for him to read out to the men of the volunteer corps at romsey near her old home she used the incident again in an address to the nightingale probationers eighteen eighty three a few days later november eighteenth eighteen eighty two there was a royal review on the horse guards parade of the troops returned from the egyptian campaign and miss nightingale was present at mr gladstone's invitation on a stand erected in the prime minister's garden she was seated between him and mrs gladstone and mrs gladstone in recalling the occasion used to say that there were tears in miss nightingale's dear eyes as the poor ragged fellows marched past her presence on this occasion was observed and she was invited accordingly to attend the opening of the new law courts by the queen december four she was given a place on the dais and the queen noticing her sent a message to say how pleased she was to see miss nightingale there looking well 
lord wolsey's egyptian campaign of eighteen eighty two was short and sharp and from the combative point of view admirably managed but there was a good deal of sickness among the soldiers the fighting during these years eighteen eighty to eighty two both in south africa and in egypt put to the test the reorganizations of the army medical and hospital service which had taken place since miss nightingale was in office with sidney herbert the result of the test was far from satisfactory there were indeed no scandals on the scale of the crimean war and the death rate during the egyptian campaign may fairly be cited as proof that great improvements had been effected since that time but there were grave defects and miss nightingale played an active part both in bringing them to light and in striving for their prevention in future she was in close touch with the hospital arrangements both in natal and in egypt through her friends among the lady nurses and lady visitors from natal one of the latter mrs hawthorne had sent her many particulars supported by evidence of neglect in the hospitals miss nightingale wrote a memorandum on the subject which she submitted again through sir harry verney to the secretary for war mr childers appointed a court of inquiry june eighteen eighty two presided over by sir evelyn wood to investigate the charges the committee reported that improvements in the system of nursing are both practicable and desirable this is rather a mild opinion wrote sir robert lloyd lindsay lord wantage to miss nightingale october twenty three eighteen eighty two considering that all the independent evidence went to show that the orderlies were often drunk and riotous that they ate the rations of the sick and left the nursing of the patients to the convalescents the egyptian campaign followed and many cases of neglect were alleged the committee was reconstituted october eighteen eighty two on an enlarged basis under the chairmanship of the earl of morley with instructions to inquire with special reference to the egyptian campaign into the organization of the army hospital corps and the whole question of hospital management and nursing in the field miss nightingale had a close ally during this inquiry in lord wantage who was a member of the committee she suggested witnesses to him and sent him elaborate briefs for their examination she was furnished day by day with the minutes of evidence and when the time came for preparing the report she wrote successive papers of suggestions which lord wantage submitted to the chairman i think wrote lord wantage may five eighteen eighty three that the report although dealing with details and not going much beyond them will be of service and i am bound to say many of the best suggestions come from you and for these i beg to thank you most sincerely and again in sending her an early proof of the report june twelfth i can only repeat once more how valuable your aid was to me during the inquiry if the secretary of state carries out the report some of the most useful improvements will have originated with you miss nightingale found in the evidence a justification of her forebodings during past years it disclosed evils comparable in kind though not in extent to those at scutari and in the crimea supplies procurable had not been procured hospital equipment was incomplete the cooking was defective and so forth these defects were due miss nightingale considered to the undoing of sidney herbert's work the purveyor's department reorganized by him and her had been abolished for the rest their whole scheme of reorganization had been based on the regimental system which had now been abandoned for a unitary system though in time of war some return to the former was a necessity miss nightingale did not wholly condemn these changes in themselves what she complained of was that they had not been thought out in all the details or in terms of war this was what she meant when she noted the progress of reorganization during previous years and pronounced it lacking in administrative skill she now said that the changes must be accepted and threw herself into the work of lending aid towards improvement she saw and corresponded with the director-general of the army medical department dr t crawford than whom she said we have not had such a man of unflagging energy since alexander she made friends with many other army doctors among them was surgeon major g j h evatt 
who had seen service in india and was now at the royal military academy he assisted miss nightingale in suggestions for the reorganization of the army hospital corps in india which she sent to lord ripon she was consulted on revised regulations for various branches of the medical service she was in constant communication with her old associates captain galton and dr sutherland and she urged the former to keep the question of reform to the front by writing in the papers and magazines end of lord ripon and general gordon sections one through five part seven chapter six of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook lord ripon and general gordon continued sections six seven and eight in the middle of eighteen eighty three miss nightingale was in the thick of her two main preoccupations the defence of lord ripon's indian policy and the reform of the army hospital service when an opportunity came to her for putting in a word on behalf of each of these causes in the highest quarter the decoration of the royal red cross had been instituted by royal warrant on april twenty three eighteen eighty three and miss nightingale's attendance was requested at windsor on july the fifth to receive the decoration for her special exertions in providing for the nursing of the sick and wounded soldiers and sailors she was invited to dine and sleep at the castle on the occasion the queen whose observant eye had noticed at the opening of the law courts that miss nightingale was attended by sir harry verney hoped that he would again accompany her the state of her health compelled miss nightingale to decline the invitation with the greater reluctance because there were two subjects india and the army medical service on which the queen had permitted her to speak on a previous occasion and on which she would now have highly prized the opportunity of speaking again she begged to be permitted to write to her majesty instead the permission was given and miss nightingale sent a letter upon the state of the army medical and hospital services a second letter contained an expository vindication of lord ripon's indian measures in this connection it had been intimated to miss nightingale by a friend that she would do well to describe in a few words what the ilbert bill really was the queen had doubtless read voluminous dispatches about it and about and perhaps been addressed on the subject by copious ministers as if she were a public meeting and like the greater number of her subjects may have felt little the wiser miss nightingale condensed into the following words the nature of the bill and the case for it the so-called ilbert bill is intended to give limited powers to try europeans outside of the presidency towns to native magistrates and judges who after long trial of their judicial qualification in corresponding positions have shown themselves worthy to be entrusted with this duty and have risen to that grade where for their official responsibility such powers are required it is no new experiment but has been tried on the bench of the high courts and in the chief magistracies of the presidency towns miss nightingale then went on to refer to the queen's noble proclamation of eighteen fifty eight and to connect the ilbert bill with it the queen has proclaimed that she will admit the natives of india to share in the government of that country without distinction of race and creed she has invited them to educate themselves to qualify for her service as englishmen do in face of the greatest difficulties they have in competition with our ablest young men gained 
honourable place and by trial in long service have proved themselves efficient and trustworthy it would be disastrous miss nightingale went on to argue if in deference to clamour the queen's government were to draw back from giving effect to her majesty's gracious assurances sir henry ponsonby to miss nightingale osborne august thirteenth eighteen eighty three the queen hopes you will forgive her for not answering your letters herself her majesty has been so constantly interrupted in writing that she has entrusted to me the duty of conveying to you her thanks for the two very interesting communications you have been good enough to address to her majesty with regard to the ilbert bill which is now being so vehemently discussed the queen cannot but deplore the acrimony with which the question has been treated but as it is a matter under the consideration of her majesty's government the queen is unwilling to express any opinion upon the measure at present it gave the queen sincere pleasure to confer the decoration of the royal red cross upon you who have worked so hard and who have effected so much in the sanitary departments of the army and the queen is very grateful for your observations on the military medical questions and has read with much interest the paper in the fortnightly review to which you called her attention her majesty considers your remarks of the highest value and fully concurs in your opinion that the hospital services should be carried out in a manner calculated to relieve the medical officer from the care of details not belonging to his medical work the abolition of the purveyor's department and the change from the regimental to the general system which the queen much regrets were both effected on the recommendation of the medical officers and the queen observes that those who gave evidence before the late committee of inquiry consider these steps to have improved the efficiency of their department these matters have been prominently brought to her majesty's notice lately as the selection of a new commandant to netley hospital is now under consideration and the comparative advantages of naming a combatant or medical officer are being discussed the queen was extremely sorry to have missed the opportunity of seeing you at windsor but trusts that on some future occasion she may be more fortunate i am to repeat to you her majesty's thanks for your letters and to assure you that the queen will always be glad to receive any communications from you the practical interest which queen victoria took in army matters may have been a factor in the prompt attempt to remedy the evils to which miss nightingale had called attention in the following year miss nightingale obtained through lord wantage a statement from the war office october seventeenth eighteen eighty four showing how far the recommendations of lord morley's committee had been carried out there were very few of the evils left unremedied at any rate on paper there was one feature of the hospital service upon which the inquiries above mentioned threw nothing but praise and that was the female nursing lord wolseley whose service dated back like miss nightingale's to the crimean war was particularly emphatic on this point i have always thought he said that the presence of lady nurses in our military hospitals was a matter of the first consequence when as a general i have inspected hospitals i always felt i could not really get at the patients few men would dare to speak against the orderlies of a hospital no matter how you may question them but they would tell what they think very freely to a lady nurse who is attendant upon them apart from the incalculable boon which the care and kindness of such ladies confers upon the sick or wounded soldier i regard their presence in all our hospitals as a most wholesome check upon the whole personnel in them 
i am sure that the patients in a ward where there was a lady nurse would always receive the wine food etc ordered them by the doctor and the irregularities of the orderly such as those complained of by mrs hawthorne could not take place i am therefore of opinion that it was very wrong to have prevented that lady from entering the wards at pierre to maritzburg and i think it would be desirable to call attention in the queen's regulations to the great advantage of procuring the aid of lady nurses at all stations both in peace and war all this is precisely the doctrine preached by miss nightingale when she said that the most important function of the female nurse was the education of the male orderly lord wolseley in the memorandum just quoted was speaking from personal experience in south africa subsequent experience in egypt confirmed his opinions and in his evidence before the later committee of inquiry he was even more emphatic the employment of lady nurses to a very large extent in every hospital on service was the surest way to efficiency the female nurses at cairo ismailia and alexandria were of the greatest assistance it was delightful to go into a ward where there was a female nurse their presence made the greatest difference if i might so describe them although it is not perhaps a complimentary way of describing them they are the best spies in the hospital upon everybody seven the nurses were soon to have another opportunity of proving their usefulness but we must first return with miss nightingale to lord ripon's indian reforms the fate of which was in the middle of eighteen eighty three still uncertain which way she wrote to friends likely to know do you think the storm is going she had urged the viceroy not to yield to the storm which raged round him and he had assured her that he had no inclination whatever to do so though he would not be unwilling to admit reasonable amendments to his proposals the viceroy's letters showed miss nightingale that his policy would need all the support that those in england who agreed with it could give the storm centre was the ilbert bill and lord ripon's letter had prepared miss nightingale for coming events reasonable amendments were ultimately accepted and the ilbert bill was passed january eighteen eighty four the compromise was that europeans tried before native judges should have the right of claiming a jury the so-called compromise is in fact a surrender wrote one of miss nightingale's radical friends but for her part she held that the viceroy had wisely yielded somewhat on a less important point in order to improve the prospects of his more important measures with these from time to time lord ripon reported satisfactory progress after some difficulties with the india office he was allowed to establish an agricultural department in bengal the prospects of the land tenure bills were favourable the local self-government bills were passed educational reforms had been made then presently it was announced in london that lord ripon had resigned and would shortly return to england miss nightingale was much perturbed and accused her friend of deserting the empire lord ripon in reply sent her a long letter of explanation the gist of which was that he had exhausted his powers of usefulness in india and that by retiring now instead of serving his full term he would be more likely to obtain a sympathetic successor the successor was soon appointed and early in november lord dufferin came to see miss nightingale my visit from lord dufferin she wrote to dr sutherland november sixth took place yesterday we went over many things sanitation land tenure agriculture civil service etc etc and i am to send him a note of each but about sanitary things he says he is perfectly ignorant especially of indian sanitary things but he says give me your instructions and i will obey them i will study them on my way out send me what you think supply the powder and i will fire the shot 
give me quickly what instructions you think i should send him this letter reached dr sutherland on a friday and she had commanded him to send in his notes before monday but as ill luck had it the doctor was busy in working at the cholera bacillus with a beautiful vienna microscope purchased with this object that would occupy him on friday and saturday and sunday was sunday so the viceroy must wait the reader who remembers an earlier chapter will be able to imagine miss nightingale's wrath notes and telegrams now withering now pleading followed fast upon each other i did not know the bacillus was of more consequence than a viceroy if you did a little on sunday the recording angel would drop not a tear but a smile but dr sutherland was not to be cajoled into abandoning either his science or his sabbatarianism and on the former point he put in a very good plea in mitigation of judgment if dr koch's cholera bacillus turned out well the discovery would save many more lives than lord dufferin however carefully instructed was likely to do miss nightingale did not believe in the bacillus but allowed herself to be appeased especially as it turned out that lord dufferin was not leaving london till a day or two later than she had supposed so she and dr sutherland collaborated in indoctrinating their fifth viceroy in the truths of their sanitary gospel there is a formidable list in her hand of papers for lord dufferin as he was as good as his word he must have had a strenuous voyage on starting he sent to her one of his pretty little letters lord dufferin to miss nightingale s s tasmania november thirteenth eighteen eighty four my dear miss nightingale i duly received the papers you were good enough to send me and you may be quite sure of my studying them with the attention they deserve i well know how well entitled you are to speak with authority in reference to indian questions and i can well believe that you have thought out many conclusions which it would be of the greatest benefit to me to ponder over i hope you will forgive me for adding that one of the pleasantest sweets of office i have yet tasted has been the privilege i acquired of coming to pay you that little visit meanwhile miss nightingale in the hope of completing the new viceroy's education had written an account of her interview to lord ripon so that when they met he might know on what points his successor most needed indoctrinating lord dufferin had not long been gone when an opportunity offered itself for another effort at evangelization at the end of november mr gladstone called upon miss nightingale he had come without an appointment and she was unable to see him but assuming for her purpose that he had proposed to discuss indian questions she sent him a written statement of her views on various matters and asked leave to write again with more special reference to lord ripon's splendid record mr gladstone thanked her december sixth for the valuable letter said that the best use he could make of it would be to commend it to the attention of lord kimberley and added that he would be very glad to hear her views about lord ripon's administration she had wanted to interest mr gladstone and was disappointed that he had only passed her letter on to lord kimberley who she thought meant the india council a body not sympathetic to the ripon policy but as she had been given the opening she made another attempt mr gladstone was of course in general sympathy with lord ripon but she wanted the prime minister to give greater prominence and emphasis to indian internal reforms in his speeches she did not succeed i wish i could hope wrote a friend who knew both india and mr gladstone well january fourth eighteen eighty five that you could make some real impression on him but at his age and at this time when his hands are so full what can you expect he has never given his mind to india and it is too late now it was not only mr gladstone who was preoccupied at this time with other things than the welfare of the indian peoples miss nightingale soon discovered this lord ripon 
was nearly due in england he ought she said to receive a popular welcome as enthusiastic as any accorded to a conquering general as there were no signs of any preparation in that sort she worked very hard though with very little success to organize a welcome in the form of laudatory articles in various newspapers and reviews she herself wrote an enthusiastic appreciation but she was unwilling to sign it the editors were willing to publish anything to which miss florence nightingale would give her name but for articles in praise of lord ripon's policy without that attraction there was no demand as soon as it was disclosed that what was offered was only an unsigned article or an article signed by some nominee of hers the editors with one consent discovered that exigencies of space prevented its insertion and this was not surprising for khartoum had fallen and the government was tottering miss nightingale was as keenly interested as any one else in those things but there were few beside herself to whom the standing problems of indian administration were matters of life and death no less passionately interesting than the fate of a hero or the fall of a ministry eight lord wolseley had been appointed to command a gordon relief expedition in august eighteen eighty four there were already female nurses in egypt some had been retained at cairo after the arabi campaign of eighteen eighty two others had been sent to swakin during the military operations of eighteen eighty three more were now sent by the government and some were ordered up the nile to wadi halfa miss nightingale felt this to be a great event luther says she wrote to miss pringle clayton october eleventh eighteen eighty four that he looks and sees the firmament which god has made without pillars and we wretched men are always afraid that it will tumble down unless we make our little pillars half a foot high it is thirty-four years since i was at wadi halfa how little i could ever have thought that there would be trained nurses now there o oh, faithless me that think god cannot make his firmament without pillars but miss nightingale's religion enjoined as we know working with god the ultimate issue did not rest upon the little pillars but they must be set up for what they are worth none the less and miss nightingale threw herself heart and soul into forwarding the egyptian nursing campaign presently more nurses were sent out on private initiative some by the national aid society others by a committee of ladies on february twenty eighteen eighty five lady rosebery called at south street she and mrs gladstone and lady salisbury and other ladies with the princess of wales were proposing to establish a committee of their own to send additional comforts for the sick and wounded as well as additional nurses in order to secure unity of administration and in loyalty to lord wantage's society miss nightingale advised against any separate organization and the committee which she then agreed to join was reconstituted as the princess of wales's branch of the national aid society the superintendent of the nurses sent out by the government was one of miss nightingale's dearest pupils miss rachel williams whose acquaintance we have made already under her pet name of the goddess she had been in indifferent health and much worried she stayed in south street while arrangements were pending and miss nightingale announced the departure to miss pringle march four our darling has started this morning by the navarino with seven nurses for suez if you had seen as i did how the moment it was settled that she was to have this work the cloud and the load were lifted off her and she became again the goddess and her youth returned you would have felt as she said that providential goodness had opened and guided every step of her way as soon as her appointment was made she looked as beautiful and bonny as ever the rapidity of miss nightingale's decision her memory for matters of detail her thoughtfulness for others even in trivial things her kindliness of heart interlacing the practical instinct 
the mingled playfulness and gravity of her manner these things are all illustrated in the reminiscences of another member of the party which sailed for egypt in the navarino i was then sister of one of the surgical wards at king's college hospital it was on a saturday in february about midday just as i was due to attend the operation cases from my ward that a one-armed commissionaire appeared at the ward door a note for sister philippa from miss nightingale he said the request it contained was characteristic of the writer decisive yet kindly would i leave in three days time for service in the soudan if so i must be at her house for instructions on monday at eight thirty a m at marlborough house to be interviewed by queen alexandra then princess of wales at eleven a m and immediately afterwards at messrs capper's grace church street to be fitted for my war uniform would i also breakfast with her on wednesday so that she might check the fit of my uniform and wish me god speed months afterwards when the war was over and we were quietly chatting over things at clayton how she enjoyed hearing the numerous trivial details of that three days rush again and again she would refer to that afternoon when i had to stand by the patient's side in the operating theatre mechanically waiting on the surgeons outwardly placid yet inwardly as i told her in a fever of excitement not so much at the thought of going to the front as at the fact i had been chosen by her to follow in her footsteps on the monday above referred to punctually at half-past eight i arrived at south street wondering what my reception would be but before ten minutes had passed all wonder and speculation had given place to unbounded admiration and even at that early acquaintanceship affection for the warm-hearted old lady who counselled me as a nurse mothered me as an output from her home and urged me to spare no point myself specially where the soldiers were concerned remember she said when you are far away up country possibly the only english woman there that those men will note and remember your every action not only as a nurse but as a woman your life to them will be as the rings a pebble makes when thrown into a pond reaching far reaching wide each ripple gone beyond your grasp yet remembered almost to exaggeration by those soldiers lying helpless in their sickness see that your every word and act is worthy of your profession and your womanhood then she asked me to accept an india rubber travelling bath as her parting gift to a one-time probationer who had once reminded her that cleanliness was next to godliness and in spite of the merry twinkle in her eye as she said this there were tears of anxious kindness as she added god guard you in his safe-keeping and make you worthy of his trust our soldiers i saw nothing more of her till wednesday morning the troop ship in which we were to go out left tilbury docks at eleven o'clock and i was to breakfast with miss nightingale at half-past seven it was rather a rush to manage it but it was well worth any amount of inconvenience to have that last hour with her and it was a picture that will always remain above all others in my memory propped up in bed the pillows framing her kindly face with its lace-covered silvery hair and twinkling eyes i often think her sense of humour must have been as strong a bond between her and the soldiers as her sympathy was the coffee toast eggs and honey a real english breakfast dear child she said and it is good to know you will have honestly earned the next one you eat in england and suppose i don't return to eat one at all i asked well you will have earned that too dear heart she answered quietly who can be surprised that we worshipped our chief other nurses were going out in the same ship as i and when we entered our cabins we found a bouquet of flowers for each of us attached to which was god speed from florence nightingale 
six months after in the glare and heat of an august afternoon when the egyptian campaign was a thing of the past a shipload of sick and wounded soldiers glided slowly into the docks at southampton while i was helping to transfer some of the most serious cases to netley a telegram was handed to me it was from miss nightingale am staying at clayton cleaners and painters in possession of ten south street but two rooms mrs neild the housekeeper and a warm welcome are awaiting your arrival there use them as long as you wish on arriving at south street i found it all just as she had said and by the first post next day came a letter from clayton such a home welcome it was well worth all the heat and glare of a soudan summer all the absence of water and presence of insects and the hundred and one other uncomfortable things that flesh is heir to during similar circumstances to get such a letter of welcome as that it ended up with make south street your headquarters till your work is finished there was much detail to complete in connection with the national aid society before i could leave london and then come to me at claydon so after a couple of weeks work in london i went to claydon and there during a month's rest in one of the most beautiful of england's country homes i learned to know and understand miss nightingale to realize what the friendship of a character like hers means the essence of friendship says emerson is tenderness and trust no words better describe our chief than these sister philippa was only one of the many war nurses to whom their chief showed this tender friendship during their service abroad she was constant in letters of encouragement and advice to miss williams at suez ten south street july three the orderlies are not hopeless but untrained government are now doing all they can in my day they were hopeless they placed them now under the sisters the great business of the sisters is to train them it is the more aggravating when there are so few sisters that they can't give time to train these men who are essential in the field oh how i wish i could send you several sisters at once but i am altogether puzzled your telegrams which i suspect were not dictated by you say sufficient would that i could help you to nurse the typhoids i am sure you are doing great good among the orderlies even though you do not know it the very fact that they see you think neglect a crime does good how well i know their fatal neglects with typhoid cases but thirty years ago women nurses were just as bad see the difference now there is a miss williams cheer up fight the good fight of faith i need not say this to my dear for she is fighting it god bless her when i am gone she will see the fruit of her labours three cheers for her adieu to god i commend you would i were his servant as you are i wonder whether you have had my letters i have written by every mail to the same ten south street july seventeenth eighteen eighty five yesterday the guards camel corps and the heavies marched into london after having been reviewed by the queen at osborne sir harry went to see them inspected by the commander-in-chief at wellington barracks i would have given anything to have seen the meeting with their comrades if i had been well enough to go and he said it was the most affecting thing he ever saw these were the men who marched across the bayuda desert a handful of men taking tender care of their handful of wounded attacked by twelve times their number and reached the nile below khartoum but when the steamer reached khartoum khartoum had fallen and gordon was dead there is a picture of gordon called the last watch where he is watching on the ramparts the last night it is very fine he is unseen and alone there is the far-off look in his eyes of solemn happiness at his reunion with god so near of deep grief for the poor black populations whom he has to leave to their misery and whom he has failed to extricate and yet of abiding faithful trust in god that he will do all things for the best 
it was his constant prayer first for god's glory then for these people's welfare and his own humiliation that is that he should feel the more himself being humbled the indwelling god in himself have the little lives of gordon reached your men yet florence nightingale was living her crimean life again in the life of her pupils many a little incident recalled the old days to her one of the nurses wrote that in her hospital the supply of soap had given out send to cairo miss nightingale answered for any quantity you like and i'll pay but only if you can do it without embroiling yourself with the authorities another of her pupils was nursing in the citadel hospital at cairo i am on night duty now she wrote and i don't dislike it at all in fact i enjoy trotting about this weird old place all by myself in the solemnity of the night and now and then hearing a low voice saying sister would you mind doing so and so sister can you give me something to ease my face etc etc and then feeding the hungry enteric patients at stated times who open their mouths and turn like so many little birds the picture drawn in this letter and the zest which it showed pleased miss nightingale greatly and she passed it on to old pupils at home they were thrilled lucky sibyl they said she is doing work like the chiefs at scutari another lady with the lamp amid the glimmering gloom and miss nightingale who received from the medical authorities of the army most satisfactory reports on the services rendered by her nurses rejoiced in their successes and usefulness she would have smiled upon any pupil at the first stroke which passed what she could do yet with thankfulness that she had been able to show the way to others there was mingled something of the wistful regrets of old age there was much in the administrative conduct of the nursing service at the front which she could have ordered better there was a paragraph in a newspaper about the attractions of afternoon tea in the nurse's tent which pained her though the reference here was not i think to any of her own nightingale nurses encouraging cheery helpful to others she was in herself sad and almost sombre it was in vain that mr jowett still enjoined her to dwell upon all that she had been able to do upon the many blessings which had attended her work you will have felt general gordon's death he wrote february twenty two as much as any one what poor creatures most of us seem in comparison with him but not you not you but the note which she struck in her next address to the probationers was all of humility old friends and comrades were dying in eighteen eighty two a dear friend of her girlhood madame mole died in paris in the same year dr farr died one of the founders in this country of her favorite science of statistics and an associate of hers in work with sidney herbert one of the most valued of her allies in later indian work sir bartle freer died in eighteen eighty four in the previous year a yet older friend and one of her wisest counsellors sir john mcneill had died he had sent her a copy of the last piece he wrote the preface to a new edition of sir alexander tullock's reply to the chelsea board in which sir john in turn replied to the version of that affair given by mr kinglake her letter to him sent with the deepest affection and veneration was in a sombre vein the correspondence recalled old days but again how little permanent progress had been made she only she began to feel was left and she so unworthy what opportunity she had been given how little use she had been able to make of them there were dark nights of the soul when such self-reproaches were grievous but some years of life would perhaps still be granted to her she would consecrate them the more devotedly to higher service to-day she wrote christmas day eighteen eighty five let me dedicate this poor old crumbling woman to thee behold the handmaid of the lord i was thy handmaid as a girl how have i backslidden end of lord ripon and general gordon continued
Sections six, seven, and eight.